Turn your Bible to First Thessalonians. Uh, First Thessalonians. If you remember uh, last, I believe it was last Sunday night, we uh, uh, we uh, talked about the uh, the um, uh, evidence of the gospel. The evidence of the gospel. We've been preaching through First Thessalonians now for I don't know. It's been a while, and uh, we still got a little ways to go. And uh, but we see the evidence of the Bible uh, of, of the gospel with the exceptional welcome of the scriptures. They were received. Uh, the engrafted word. We see the effectual work of the Scripture and uh, how it works. We see the enduring walk of the Scripture. Uh, we talked about some of those things last week. And then we see the extreme wickedness of sinners that need the gospel. Uh, but tonight, I just want to give you three things about the enemy of the gospel. The enemy of the gospel. And I'm going to use this, the enemy of the gospel. If you would, I'm going to read... Uh, verse 17, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse number uh, 17. The Bible says, But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, um, endeavored the more abundantly to your see your face with great desire. Wherefore, we would have you come, uh, come unto you, even I, Paul, once again, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now notice that little phrase there, but Satan hindered us. For what is our hope, uh, our joy, or, or uh, crown of rejoicing, are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming? For ye are uh, our glory and joy. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You for the uh, time that we have together. I pray You'll bless it. In Jesus' name, Amen. I want to just preach just a few minutes on the enemy of the gospel. We, we talked a little bit about that evidence of the gospel, but the enemy of the gospel, I want to remind you tonight uh, that Satan is not going to, he's not going to allow us to do the work of God without a fight. He's going to want to fight. It's the very word, the very name. Uh, Satan means opponent or adversary. And it's used about 50 times in the Word of God. And so Satan here is not wanting us to get the work of God done. Now we've been, listen, today was exciting. We had uh, uh, a young man, I believe his name is Michael, is that right? Uh, Michael, he got saved this morning, 11 years old, walked the aisle, raised his hand. He said, Preacher, I know for sure that I was lost and I came forward and accepted Christ as Savior. And uh, hey, Jesus saw all that went on this morning. But guess who else saw all that went on? The devil. The devil. His crowd. And the devil does not want to hear about the good news that is happening at Bible Baptist Church. And guess what the devil wants to do? He wants to throw a wrench in uh, all of the things that is going on at our church. And so I want you to notice some things. Look at verse number 17. Uh, I want you to notice Paul's estrangement. Notice this. But we, brethren, being taken from you for a short time, in presence. That word taken, notice that. That word taken carries the idea of being torn away from. And Paul was saying here uh, that I've been torn away from you for a short time in presence. Paul is writing this church at Thessalonica. I believe his, his favorite church. And he was at, of a pastor's heart. And he's, he, this separation of Paul from these Thessalonians caused him great emotional pain. He said, I'm being torn away from you, I'm desiring to be with you, but I've been torn away, and uh, Paul viewed himself as an orphan separated from his family. I mean, that's how severe uh, this being taken away is. He, he said, I've been taken away. Notice that verse again. But we, brethren, being taken away from you for a short time in presence. Hey, uh, Paul, we've we got to see the, the love and the affection and the, and the, I guess you could say, the fervency that Paul had for this church. And, uh, you know, the devil notices things. The devil knew that Paul uh, loved this church and was trying to help this church. So we see Paul's estrangement. He was taken away. No, no, number two, we see Paul's endeavor. Notice what he says in verse 17. Paul says, not in heart, endeavored the more abundantly to see your face with great desire. So Paul, he was separated physically, but he was there in heart. Amen. See that? That goes to show that Paul was saying, you know what, I can't see you with my eyes, but I'm with you. 
Paul loved these people and what a heart Paul had for his people. He, he, the Apostle Paul frequently wrote of his love for the brethren. I could read to you references in Romans chapter seven, uh, 1, verse number 7, and Ephesians chapter 6, and verse number 21, and Colossians. All of, these, all of these epistles, if you will, Paul always let his heart show that he loved his people. And let me just say, the way we can know that we are saved or one of his children is how we love the brethren. How we love one another. There ought to be unity in our church. There ought to be unity amongst the brethren, if you will. Hey, I'm telling you this, in just our short time of being at Bible Baptist Church with you, uh, my heart, uh, man, it bleeds and loves this church and my prayers has bonded me to this church. I mean, I pray for you. I started out uh, praying on the Rolodex there, the the uh, uh, the uh, whatever it's called, uh, the church roll, I guess you could say, or that, what's it called, honey? Directory. directory. Amen. And uh, I can't get that word right. And uh, directory, the church directory, and I had it there, and it was a couple little, uh, I guess a page, about a page and a half, and now I filled it in and front and back, and we've added to it, stapled to it, and there's names and names and names of people that has either joined the church or that are coming to the church or have been saved at the church. And I'm thinking, man, this prayer list just for our people has grown. And guess what? When you start praying for people, guess what? You start loving them. You start loving them. And by the way, it's hard to criticize those you pray for. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. So you, you say, preacher, how can I get rid of this critical spirit? Start praying for people. How can I start bonding with people and loving people and joining up with people? Hey, we see Paul's endeavor. He even wrote a, a words of rebuke and correction, but he still assured them of his love. If you read, and don't turn there, but 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 4, Paul rebukes this, these folks, and he rebukes people, but he said, For out of much afflic uh, affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote unto you with many tears. Not that ye would be grieved or should be grieved, but that ye might know the love which I have more abundantly unto you. Does that not sound like a man who loves his people? Amen. He said, I'm writing to you and I'm telling you that I'm disappointed or I'm correcting you or I'm rebuking you. I'm telling you what I don't like about it. Hey, there'll be some Sundays that I get up here or some Sunday nights or some Wednesday nights that I may be preaching a message and it ain't going to go over too well with you. But you can take it to the bank that this preacher is doing it because he loves. Amen. He's loving. Now, you say, preacher, how can you love somebody and only be here six months? It's called God. Amen. God does something in a pastor's heart. Now, we know that years and years of laboring together, it does make that bond stronger. We know that. But, folks, I do believe that when you start praying and seeing people grow in grace and start seeing people come to Christ, that God creates a love in you that you did not have. Amen. And when you start seeing folks slip and folks start going back in their ways and start losing their desire to serve the Lord, it breaks your heart. Hey, I promise you, I told my wife yesterday, going down the road, I said, Honey, uh, what's sad about this whole deal is we're going to have some folks that's going to start out with us and they're going to be in the church and boy, we're going to just be together. <coughs> and if we're here and God tarries His coming, 10 or 15, 20 years, we're going to look around and some of those people that start out with us won't be here. Along the way, the devil's going to get some. My dad's been pastoring that church for 32 years and just a handful of people. He'll often do it. He'll say, if you were here when I was, when I was voted in as pastor, would you stand? And there might be 10 out of 800. 32 years. Now some has died. Many have left. You say, why? And, you, and my dad said, there's no greater hurt in the world, no greater hurt than when somebody turns their back on you mm -hmm. after years of loving you and they stab their back. Stab you in the back or just leave and say, preacher, it's not you, I'm just leaving. And uh, he said, man, it, it, boy, it hurts. Oh, it hurts. But he said, son, that's what's going to make it stronger. You just might as well plan on it. There's going to be folks along the way. And you know what? We can, we can prepare ourselves and we can say, oh, it may not happen here. But folks, we've got to be real. Amen. The devil's going to get some. And this is a warning. Now, I pray he don't. 
Now you say, well, preacher, I'm worried about that family. No, how about worrying about yours? That's right. Let me let me pray over the ones and all. But don't don't be worried about somebody. You you just guard your family. Because Paul here saw some things. In verse 17, we see Paul's estrangement. He said, I'm not with you, but I'm there in heart. I love you. We see Paul's endeavor. He desired to be with these people. He loved these people. And, and let me just say, as a pastor, that I love you. I want to see you grow. I want to see you flourish. I want to see God do some amazing things in your life. You say, preacher, why do you, why do you want us to give? And I want to see God's blessings on your family. Amen. Uh, we, listen, God's going to take care of His church. I'm not worried about that. Hey, as long as we're winning souls and picking up these kids and supporting missionaries, God's going to fund His church. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. The reason I want you to give and tithe and give an increase is because I want to see God's blessings on you. Amen. I want you to come and say, Preacher, I ain't never been more blessed in my life. God's done this. Hey, this week I was at my job and they gave me a promotion. Hey, they put me over. And preacher, I don't know how all this come about, but, but preacher, uh, since I started increasing my faith promise missions and I started tithing and I started doing this, preacher, I can't explain to you. It's like the windows of heaven's opened up and I can't explain to you the blessings of God. Hey, you know what? I'll rejoice with you. Why? Amen. It does something in my heart to see you blessed. Amen. Amen. Hey, there's folks, listen, I, I was with the preacher this week. I love him to death. I told y'all a little bit about his church. Uh, one of the, some of the simplest people in the world. I love West Virginians. I love them to death. I am one, but I love them. I mean, once they now listen, they love you. They love you for life. But you ever, you ever do anything to them? Now it's over. The whole church is against you. Amen. I'm telling you, when they turn on you, it's over, and they're not forgiving you. Amen. Amen. But you know what? That, that, that man with cerebral palsy, that pastor, he works a full-time job. Now he just filed, filed for disability, and he, he needs it. He deserves it. He's got so many health problems, it ain't even funny. And he's going to be able to pastor that church. He's been pastoring that church now for five years. He's been working a full-time job, crippled, refused to file for disability. He said, I don't want to file because there's so many people walking around here on disability. It makes me sick. They don't need it. But he said, I actually need it, but I'm so prideful, I don't want... I told him, I said, you better do it. Because you actually need it. Amen? Amen. And he can pastor that church. And he, he's got so many health problems. And, and, uh, but still, he, uh, he was uh, uh, telling me, he said, Preacher, this church, what's sad is this church could support me full time, but many of them don't give in time. That's what the preacher said. He said, I don't know, we don't never know who does. He said, but I know. He said, some of these people do well, but he said, they're stingy on God. Mm. Boy, his heart broke because he pastors people that sit there with God's money in their wallet. And you know what they're going through? He said, I promise you, I've watched people that when I mention tithing and giving, they bow up on me. Mm. He said, they're in total rebellion and disobedience, but they love me, but they don't love God. Imagine pastoring that. Mm. It's awful quiet right now. <laughs> it's just natural. Listen, it's natural when a preacher starts preaching about giving and tithing, especially around Christmas. The people, they just, oh, preacher, you need to move on to point three. <laughs> because you know what? It costs us something, don't it? It costs us. Let me just say, it's going to cost you one way or the other. Yeah, that's right. It is. It's going to cost you. I'm doing it for you, not for me. God knows. I see Paul's estrangement. Number two, I see Paul's endeavor. Then lastly, I see Paul's enemy. I want you to pay attention. Paul's enemy. Notice what he said in verse number 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. But notice these words. But Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us. How often we can identify with the Satan problem. But Satan hindered us. You know, Satan is a very real enemy. I mean... Right. Folks, listen, we, we talk about Satan and we talk about, and, and people thought, yeah, the old devil, when a lot of times we, we literally, he's like a figment of our imagination, but he's real. Amen. He's real. And Satan will hinder you in some areas. Satan will try to hinder this church in some areas. He'll try to cause some division or try to hinder us in the work of God. I want you to notice some things. Notice Satan's character and titles throughout the Bible. 
In Revelation chapter number 12, he's our adversary. Uh, in, or in 1 Peter uh, chapter number 5 and verse number 8, he's our adversary. He's our accuser of the brethren in Revelation chapter 12. He's our, uh, the angel of the bottomless pit in Revelation chapter 9. He's the devil in Matthew chapter 4. He's the enemy in Matthew chapter 13. He's the father of lies in John chapter 8. He's a liar. In John chapter 8 and verse 44, he's a lying spirit in 1 Kings 22, 22. He's a murderer. In John chapter 8, the old serpent in Revelation chapter 12. Hey, Colossians, the power of darkness. In uh, Matthew chapter 12, he's the prince of devils. In Ephesians chapter 6, he's the ruler of of darkness of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, He's the Spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In Matthew chapter 4, He's the tempter. In Matthew chapter 12, He's the unclean spirit. In Matthew chapter 13, He's the wicked one, all of which is referring to Satan. He is real today. And folks, if we don't understand uh, that the devil wants to hinder us, he wants to stop you Sunday morning, he wants to stop you Sunday night, he wants to stop you Wednesday night, hey, from coming to church. But that ain't all he wants to stop you from. He wants to stop you in your daily walk with God. Right. Right. He wants to stop you in that effective witness. He wants to stop you when you're getting along with people. He wants to do something to hinder you. Why? Because if he gets an advantage, <coughs> I'm telling you, we're up against the prince of the power of the air. As the prince of the power of the air, Satan has at his disposal every demon and wicked force in these unseen worlds. You say, preacher, why should we pray? You ought to pray a hedge about your family. You, ought, you ought to pray a hedge about this church. Amen. You ought to pray a hedge around, around the leaders of this church. Listen, I, I beg of you, would you please... Pray for me. Amen. Pray for me. Pray. Listen, uh, there is a target on a pastor. There's a target on a, on a leader of the church. You say, why? Well, if the devil can get the pastor, sometimes it, it, it really, really messes up the church. Boy, he wants to mess it up. He wants to hinder us. He wants to hinder us. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 12, the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness in this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I believe that's talking about Washington, D.C. Amen. <laughs> no, listen, it, it, it could be in government. He controls them. Folks, you understand. The devil is our enemy. By the way, it's not your brother sitting across the aisle. Right. It's not the preacher across town that's preaching the gospel. You know what your enemy is? Your enemy is the flesh, the world, and the devil. We need to stop treating each other like the enemy. Satan hindered us. Satan and his forces are set on hindering the work and will of God. Hey, Paul experienced it. Many other Bible men and women experienced it. And by the way, so will we. You let us keep winning souls to Christ. Hey, you let us keep running buses and giving the missions and building buildings and renovating buildings and, and, and seeing families grow in grace and starting Sunday school classes. You let that keep going on and we'll see old Slewfoot here on the property. Sure. You say, preacher, is that what you're wanting? You better believe I don't want that. But we're going to see it. Why? Because he's already heard about what's going on in Simpsonville. You can guarantee it. You can guarantee it. But let me just say, when he shows up in force, be ready. Church, there ought to be enough prayer warriors in this building tonight to pray the devil out of here. Amen. There ought to be enough in here to pray him out. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the devil tried to get in the back door and he heard a bunch of people rattling in heaven, praying, and he said, I ain't going in there. I ain't no match for prayer, because he ain't. Matter of fact, a praying Christian makes all of hell tremble. Amen. 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 He's no match for a prayer warrior. Now, he may try everything he can, but if you're on your knees in tune with heaven, hey, the devil and his forces can't do one thing. They can launch an attack, but it's not effective when you're praying and tuned in to God. Our church needs to be praying. He's not asleep. 
He's not on vacation. He's not taking a break. Hey, the Bible warns us to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, that word sober means to be discreet or cautious. It carries the idea of being discerning. Hey, folks, we don't need to sleep because the devil is walking about. You be watching. Hey, mom and dad, be a good time to watch for your children. Well, preacher, I just want to be their friend. I don't want to upset them. That ain't being sober. Well, preacher, what if I offend my children? I'm trying to be their best friend. Stop being their best friend. The best friend they can have is one that tells them the truth. Be sober, be vigilant, hey, be discreet, be cautious. You say, preacher, it ain't very popular to tell the kids to be home by 10 o'clock. Uh, we're not looking for popularity. We're looking for somebody that's sober. Amen. Amen. Ain't nothing going on after 10 o'clock you need to be out doing. Right. Not a whole lot. That's as right. a kid. Right. Amen. 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 It's a prayer meeting. Church goes long. <laughs> Folks, you say, preacher, I just, my kids will think I'm just an old fuddy dud if I tell them to do this and tell them to do that. But folks, wherever, where have we stopped? Uh, where have we stopped being vigilant and sober? Hey, I've got three children that I'll stand before God one day and say, God, I, you gave me these children to raise up. I did the best I could because I was sober. I saw my son hanging around a kid that I thought was bad news. I'd go to my son and say, son, in love, hey, in love, I love you, but that's, that boy right there, he ain't, he ain't no count. I'm just telling you right now. I heard the way he talked to his mama. It's going over like a screen door on a submarine. I'm just tell you right now. But folks, let me just say, it's, it, it, we, in these days, we've got to stand guard against the devil. I'm telling you, we've got to stand guard against the devil. He wants our children. He wants these children. He wants these teenagers. Hey, he wants uh, these young adults that's raising these little babies. And the preacher better be standing like a bulldog. I'm telling you right now, if I see the devil raise his head up in his church, you say, you ain't never seen anybody sick of, I mean, I, listen, folks, it'll be like a pit bull on a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> you, I, if I see the devil raise his head up in this church, it's going to get on like Donkey Kong. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you right now, it's going, I, I cannot stand... Uh, uh, this this discord in the church and 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 uh, and just division and the devil just tearing things apart. Hey, we'll just address it. We'll just say, hey, devil, you get on out of here on the authority of Jesus Christ. You get on out of here, devil. Hey, get on out of here. By the way, he's got some of his people planted some time ago. He plants people. Friend, let me just tell you, we need to be vigilant, sober. That word vigil means to be aware or on the lookout. We are to be on the lookout for who? Satan. He's like a lion stalking a, a lamb. Satan is constantly looking for an opportunity to move in and devour his prey. I like watching those, those uh, National Geographic wild beast shows, you know. Watching them things. I like it. See, I can't, it's too gruesome. I, I like it. <laughs> them old wildebeest running through there that lion jumps on and gets his back drags him to the ground and I start thinking about it for a second I said you know what that's what the Bible compares the devil to he watches not for the strongest he watches for the weakest isn't that something so the devil listen to me look at me the devil is watching the church and he's going to prey on the family that ain't prayed Right. He's going to prey on the family that their marriage is about to blow to pieces. He's going to prey on the kids that they ain't no rules. Why? Because they're weak. They're weak. You know, you think the devil's going to pick a fight with somebody that just spent time in the Word of God and prayed up and just handed out some tracts and their, their families is tight just loving each other. You think, what? Well, the devil ain't going to do a whole lot with a family like that, but he will do with a family that's just fighting like cats and dogs and mm -hmm. 
I ain't read their Bible in six months. Matter of fact, they get their Bible and say, Oh, I finally found the pages all frayed up, does it look like something on fire? Car ran over it a few times, found it icicles on it. <clears throat> Under a pizza box and a floorboard. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Cheeseburgers laying on top of it. Oh, there's my Bible. Yeah, and there's your life too, right there. <laughs> Why? Because I tell you, hey, folks, the devil's looking for it as fresh meat. I tell you what I'd do tonight if I heard a message like this. I'd say, Lord, you need to keep me from that old devil. I'm going to do what I can. Amen. And now there's some, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be done. There's some walking around and they get arrogant. Boy, that's dangerous. Because they say, you know what, me and my wife, we've been married for 25 years and the devil ain't going to do nothing with us. You're the one you better watch out for. Right. My dad said he, he knew a man that worked in an acid factory, the foreman of an acid factory, and he asked that man, he said, sir, he, said, he had one of the young rookie guys came through that acid factory there, and he said, uh, he said, uh, I bet them young guys, them new workers, get burned all the time with that acid. He said, if you found, it was a bunch of catwalks over these big vats of acid. And he said, I bet y'all have accidents all the time. These young guys. Mm -hmm. That foreman said, no, it ain't never the young guys. Mm -hmm. He said, the accidents are the ones that's been working here for years. Because they get used to, listen, they get... That's mine right there. <laughs> We're trying, folks. Amen. We're trying. Have mercy on her, Mama. Hey, y'all. Listen, them ones, them ones that uh, been working around in factories and they get used to that, they don't think about it. That's the ones that have them accidents. You know what I'd do? Listen, I, if if I had my wife. Uh, you know, uh, listen, if I had my family in church, or I know a lot of folks tonight sick, or if some had to work, some, but I'd get them together at some point, and I'd say, folks, listen, we need, to, we need to make sure we don't have any holes in our fence, or we don't have any things where the devil can creep in here. We need to go through the, hey, them old, them old farmers and them old cattle ranchers, they walk them fences, and they ride them horses, and they, they make sure their fences are intact, and there ain't no broken down fences, and they have to nail them and, and wire them back up. You say, why? The enemy will get in. Well, that's what we need to do, Dad, around our home. Make sure we don't have any tore down fences. Why? Because, well, Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 11, Paul, Paul says, Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. That word wiles comes from the word methodius. It is a word which we get the word method. And Satan uh, uses different methods to defeat and destroy God's people. He is ruthless. He'll stop at nothing in hopes of defeating Christians. That word hindered. Go back to that word in verse number 18, I believe. Means to cut off or to make a road impassable. Paul, no doubt, could not travel because Satan stopped him. It carries the idea of cutting into or impeding one's course by cutting off his way. Satan wants to cut off your way. I challenge you tonight, church, as much as there's evidence of the gospel and there's equipment for the gospel, there's an enemy of the gospel. What we did Saturday and what some of you will do this week by just handing tracts out and stuff, that's exactly what the devil wants to hinder. He wants to hinder these buses. He wants to hinder the RU program. Why? Because it's helping people. It's helping people. Amen. He wants to hinder you. Mm -hmm. Folks, listen, if we've ever been aware, if we've ever been a sober in our lives, we need to be today. Why? Because the devil knows his time's running out. I really, truly believe it. He sees things. He's smart. He's sly. Let's, let's ramp it up a little bit and say, you know what, let's, let's go for God. I don't feel like serving God this week, preacher. I'm, I'm tired. I'm busy. Hey, be sober. Be vigilant. Rich, you don't understand. I, I'm a little discouraged right now. I, I know, and, and listen, the only encouragement that I can give you is found in God's Word. Hey, but there's no time for you to sit on the sidelines. Be sober. 
Be vigilant. If you know something in your home is causing a problem, I'd get it out. I'd get it out. I'd say, you know what, this is causing division, this is causing a problem, and I, I don't want to give place to